All right, so uh, last week we finished off 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And so this morning I'm going to continue on with the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Um, in last week's passage, we covered some of the initial ways that Paul was thankful for the Christians at Thessalonica. In particular, he was thankful that they were chosen by God, how they imitated the right people, and then became examples to other believers in the way they shared the gospel through the words and actions. In general, that opening section of chapter 1, we were introduced to Paul the Evangelist. Here now in chapter 2, we'll meet Paul the pastor, for it explains how much he cared for the new believers in the churches that he planted. In this chapter, Paul will elaborate a little more on some of the themes that he had just mentioned there in chapter 1. The first section of chapter 2 will explain the kind of character he and his companions had while they um, lived among them. And then in the last section, which we'll get to next week, Paul will recall the Thessalonians' response to their, to their message in the midst of great persecution. So today, as we cover that first section, he'll use his own testimony to explain two motives Christians should have to remain pure and effective witnesses in a dark world. But simply put, our passage today will teach us that desiring to please God and desiring to please that and desiring that others please God will result in a bold and effective witness. And I've titled today's message, The Character Traits of a Christian, because that's what we'll also be seeing today, some of the character traits that we ought to have as believers. And before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask him to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together, whether those here uh, that are present or those that are currently watching online. Lord, we know that you have a reason and purpose that you brought us all here together. And so, Lord, I pray that your will be done and that your purposes are fulfilled. Pray that your word will go out powerfully, that it will be planted deep in the hearts and minds of those listening to this message. Pray that it will transform lives and relationships. It will bring healing and comfort, and it will, it will, that it will also convict of sin, Lord. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit right now, Lord. So that, again, that the distractions, whatever's going on, uh, will not distract us. Those things that are going on in our lives will not distract us from what you have to say to us this morning. Use me as your instrument and vessel, Lord to honor you and glorify you. We love you and adore you, praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, pray this, amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, we'll be only covering the first 12 verses, but I've broken this down into two sections. One... And a long one, really short. All right. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And the Word of God says, For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit with you was not without result. On the contrary, after we had previously suffered and were treated outrageously in Philippi, as you, as you know, we were emboldened by our God to speak the gospel of God to you in spite of great opposition. For our exhortation didn't come from error or impurity or an intent to deceive. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please people, but rather God, who examines our hearts. For we never used flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives, God is our witness. And we didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others. Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you, as a nurse nurses her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become dear to us. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, Paul briefly alluded to his personal character and conduct while he was at Thessalonica. Well, now he launches into a more thorough review of his ministry, message, and lifestyle. He begins the main body of this letter by telling his Thessalonian re brothers and sisters that his visit to them was not without result. Now, by beginning with the word for, Paul is connecting uh, what he just said in, verse, in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, to what he's about to say next. So, in light of this, here's I, how I would paraphrase this first verse. The reason that your witness was so effective and we apostles didn't have to witness as much as we would have isn't just because those to whom you witnessed became witnesses, but also because our witness to you wasn't a failure. If you didn't catch that, let me repeat that. The reason, this is the paraphrase, my paraphrase of verse 1. The reason that your witness was so effective and we apostles didn't have to witness as much as we would have isn't just because those to whom you witnessed became witnesses, but also because our witness to you wasn't a failure. At the end of verse 2, we're told the reason Paul's witness wasn't a failure. Despite the opposition to his preaching, he was emboldened to speak the gospel of God. Now, furthermore, in other Bibles, the words without result is translated as in vain. In the Greek, that word means that the content of Paul's preaching wasn't empty of truth or that the effect of his ministry wasn't empty since there was much fruit. And what was that fruit? What was that fruit that was produced? Simply their conversion and a church had been established. In addition, the word in vain can also refer to the character of Paul's ministry. Meaning that his visit wasn't empty or hollow. As if he were just a mere salesman or a paid motivational speaker. So the point here is that there's a connection between character and results. In other words, sound character produces credible results. Now, 
If you remember last week, the message was how you can be more effective at, at preaching and sharing the gospel. And I explained how your, not just your words, but your actions are very powerful testimony tools. Well, here now, he shares that, you know, we, we see that character, your character, the character of a person is also important. It's also an effective instrument to share the, in sharing the gospel. See this, the ministry of character is the primary ministry of a Christian. As a believer, what you are, brother and sister, what you are is far more important than anything you ever say because your unconscious influence speaks more loudly than your conscience influence. Spurgeon said this, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. Carve your name on hearts, not marble. The Bible indicates that our thought lives, our thought lives ultimately determine our character. In the New King James Version, Solomon said in Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And here's what I mean by our thought lives. In his book, Influence, Dr. Robert Cialdini of Arizona State University relates the story of a jewelry store owner who was preparing to go on vacation and left tasks for her staff to perform. You may have heard this story already, or I may have mentioned it before, but if you haven't, let me tell you what that portion of, the, uh, of this uh, story is. Well, this jewelry store owner had a line of jewelry that, ha that hadn't been selling, and she wanted the price cut in half. In her haste, however, she left a note that was unclear. When she returned, she was delighted to find that every piece of the jewelry was gone. She was, however, shocked to find that her, st her staff had doubled the price of the jewelry. The pieces that had him been selling went out the door immediately once the price was raised because it changed the way people thought about them. Church, let me reiterate what I just said. Our thoughts, our thought lives, our thoughts determine our actions. What seems to us to be shocking and out of character behavior would be explained if we could see the thought processes that had been going on internally. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said, A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. See, here's the thing. It's impossible to do rightly while thinking wrongly for an extended period of time. What's inside will come out. If you want your life to be marked by righteous actions, you must think righteous thoughts. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell, dwell on these things. 
Abigail Van Buren. This is what she said. The best index to a person's character is one, how he treats people who can't do him any good, and two, how he treats people that can't fight back. Going on to verse 2, Paul then noted the conditions of his ministry. He reminds them that he and his companions began the work in Thessalonica after they'd been forced out of Philippi, where they had been beaten and imprisoned. But despite the bitter opposition and outrageous treatment at, at Philippi, they pressed on to Thessalonica. There, with the courage which only God can bring, they preached the gospel even in the face of much conflict. Even there, they faced much conflict, but they preached it with the courage that only God can give. And so what was it that distinguished the gospel of God from other man-made gospel, from other man-made gospels. With man-made gospels, there's always a hidden agenda or a selfish motive. But when people heard Paul preached, they immediately knew that no man could have possibly come up with it. It wasn't of human origin. Why? Because it's nothing less than God's plan for man's salvation. The Christian faith isn't the accumulated wisdom of pious souls, nor the insight of men of religious genius, but the divine plan for dealing with our sin. For those of you who have doubts, about what Christianity is all about, following Christ. Let me re repeat that again. The Christian faith isn't about the accumulated wisdom of pious souls, nor the insight of men of religious genius, but it's the divine plan for dealing with our sin. Now in verse 3, Paul lays out the message, motive, and method of his ministry. Let me remind you, back in verse 2, he laid out his, the conditions of his ministry. Well, now he lays out the message, motive, and method of his ministry. In the beginning of verse 3, he states the message of his ministry. For our exhortation did not come from error. Here he assured them that the message was true. Six times in the letter he mentioned the gospel. This message of Christ's death and resurrection is a true message and is the only true gospel. Paul received this gospel from God and not from anybody else. Not from books, not from looking at the stars, not from looking at shells in the sea or on the beach. It came from God. And as I already mentioned, it's the only good news that saves the lost sinner. Next, in the middle of verse 3, he states the motive of his ministry. He wasn't guilty of impurity, for his motives were clean. According to Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, it's possible, it is possible to preach the right message with the wrong motives. Unfortunately, some people in those days used religion as a means for making money. Let me share something with you. One of the greatest obstacles to spread the gospel, church, 
ironically, is the church. It's not hard to, to think of all so many Christian leaders, pastors from the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years who have been so immoral and greedy that even the world itself has been repulsed. Many Christians might think that they're above such gross sins. But Paul warns them, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Paul wasn't a person interested in as using the gospel as a means for making money. Not Paul. He was open and honest in all his dealings and he even worked at a, at a trade to earn a living, to earn his own support. You see, Paul was very sensitive about money matters. He didn't want to give anyone reason to accuse him of being a religious salesman. And it's, it's an important point. If, if, you, if you're going to a church and you know, see if he's selling you, listen carefully and see if he's trying to sell you the gospel. If he's using the word of God, if he's using the message of Jesus Christ to sell you an idea, a concept, sell you salvation, to sell you how to live a good life. Now, many of you know that I work, I also work for a living. I don't you know, get a single penny from the church, but I say that because I don't also ever want to be known as that I have to be up here because I'm earning a paycheck. No, I'm up here because I love to share the word of God. I love to share the gospel afterwards when include the message. Because I don't know. I, 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 none of us know who may be listening and watching and that it is transforming lives. It is saving marriages that it is saving people from certain demise, that it is saving people from addiction. The gospel message should never be up for sale. Now, although he was an apostle, he did have the privilege of receiving support, but he gave up that right. Paul gave up that right. And he did that in order to be free from any possible blame that would disgrace the ministry. Now, in the rest of verse 3 and all the way to verse 5, he states the method of his ministry. There he explains that he had no intent to deceive, to win converts. The word translated deceive carries the idea of baiting a hook. In other words, Paul didn't trap people into being saved the way a clever salesman traps people into buying his product. Spiritual witnessing and Christian salesmanship are different. Salvation doesn't lie at the end of a clever argument or a subtle presentation. As verse 5 says, it's the result of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Often, we hear, I don't care what your method is, as long as your message is right. But some methods are unworthy of the gospel. 
They're cheap. Whereas the gospel is a costly message that required the death of God's only son. They, those cheap uh, methods, are worldly, worldly and man-centered, whereas the gospel is a divine message centered. It's centered in God's glory. Paul's enemies in Thessalonica accused him of being a cheap peddler of this new message. They said that his only motive was to make money. But in describing himself as a faithful steward, Paul answered those critics. And Paul's readers, they knew that he told the truth. Again, we see in verse 5 that Paul appealed to the witness of God and to their own witness. It even says in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, that he, Paul, had a clear conscience towards God and men. Also in verse 5, we see that Paul abhorred, he hated flattery. David, King David, all the way back in the Old Testament, hated this sin. He wrote in Psalm chapter 12, verse 2, they lie to one another, they speak with flattering lips and deceptive hearts. I once read that a flatterer is a, per, a flatterer, and I hope this doesn't describe you. I once read that a flatterer is a person who manipulates rather than communicates. A flatterer can use either truth or lies to achieve his unholy purpose which is to control your decisions for their own profit. Some people even flatter themselves. In the ESV, in the English Standard Version, Psalm chapter 36, verse 2 says, For he flatters himself in his own eyes. This self-flattery was the sin of Haman, that evil man, in the book of Esther. He was so interested in flattering himself that he even plotted to slaughter all the Jews to achieve that goal. Some people even try to flatter God. In Psalm 78, verse 36, and says this, Nevertheless, they, speaking of Israel, didn't flatter him, with their mouth. And they did flatter, I'm sorry, nevertheless they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. Friends, flattery is another form of lying. It means saying one thing to God with our lips while our hearts are far from him. And sadly, there are Christians who try to win friends and influence people by appealing to their egos. However, a true ministry of the gospel deals honesty, honestly, honestly, but lovingly with sin and judgment and leaves the unbeliever with nothing to boast of in himself. Like Paul, our method ought to be as pure as our motive. In other words, we ought to present the Word of God in the power of the Spirit and trust God to work. If you're the kind of person that has been used to using flattery all your life, I need to stop. I need to cut it out now. You're not gaining anything. That person isn't gaining anything. And again, as I said, you're essentially lying to them. You can be honest. 
person. We ought to be, again, honest. Uh, we ought to be honest, but also loving. Now, if we're dealing with someone that is an unbeliever, we still need to share the truth. If they have a problem with gambling, you don't want to be the kind of person, the kind of Christian who goes up to them and says, hey, how was your weekend? How much money did you make at the casino? Or if you know they've been dealing with you know, some kind of addiction, you don't want to continue to flatter them by saying, oh, you look great. You must feel alive or whatever it may be. No. Tell them. You know what it is? Going in the wrong direction. You're going to hurt, not only are you hurting yourself, but you're eventually going to hurt others and it's going to lead you to a dark path. Trust in Christ. Trust in Jesus. Come to Him or come back to Him. He will, he will set you free. In verses 6 and 7, we have another in, impressive insight into the character of this great man of God. As Christ's apostles, he and his colleagues were entitled to financial support, here called glory, from the Thessalonians. But they were determined that they would not burden some, uh, not burden, uh, be a burden to them. So as, you know, again, some of this stuff I mentioned already, but they worked night and day to provide for their own needs. On the other hand, it was a different story at Corinth. There, Paul works, works so as to not give his critics any ground for accusing him of preaching for money. In Thessalonica, he worked because the saints were poor and persecuted, and he, he didn't want to be an added burden to them. So instead of being demanding of them instead of saying, oh, you've got to give me this, you know, the, the, the share, the tithe, the money. Instead of being demanding towards God's children, he was gentle among them as a nursing mother caring, caring for her own children. If you're a mother and you've nursed, you know, I don't know, but maybe you know that feeling of holding that child in your arms as he's nursing, he or she is nursing. You know that that child is being provided for and that that milk is nourishing that child's body by giving it the vitamins or uh, you know, uh, the, the nourishments it needs to grow stronger, to help their immune system. You see, Paul realized that new converts need this kind of nursing. And he carried his ministry and he carried on uh, with, this, with his ministry with all the care. With all the loving care that a, that a mother has as she's nursing her child. As believers, as Christians, we ought to be that way towards new... If you're a mature Believer, this is the same way you've got to be towards newer believers, younger believers. You've got to be gentle. You've got to care for those new believers. You know they need nourishment. They need the simple things. And so you must. It's important as a, again, as a more mature believer, Find ways to nourish that newer 
newer believer. All right. And I want to look at the last few verses of our passage. So let's go back to our Bibles. And pick up in verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we will not be burdened, not, not burden any of you. We preach God's gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how we devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you, each one of you to live worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. As you can see in the previous verses, Paul compared, Paul compared himself to a nursing mother. Well, in these verses now, you show, it shows us that Paul considered, these verses show us that Paul considered himself a spiritual father to the new believers in Thessalonica, just as he did towards the saints at Corinth. He wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, for you have many countless instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ, Jesus, through the gospel. The Spirit of God used the Word of God in Paul's ministry, and many people in Thessalonica, Thessalonica were led to, the Christ, led to the cross and were born again into the family of God. But the Father only begets children, but the Father not only begets children, He also cares for them. Now, as He defended His own work against false accusers, Paul pointed out three of His duties as a spiritual father to the Thessalonians. Three, three duties as a spiritual father to the Thessalonians. In verse 9, he points out his work. Basically, that the father, that a father works to support his family. Even though the Christians at Philippi sent financial help, Paul still made tents and paid his own way. No one could accuse him of using his ministry for his own profit. Later in 2 Thessalonians, though, Paul used this fact to shame the lazy Christians in that church. Now, although Paul used the words labor and hardship, another Bible translation used the words our struggles and hard work, toil and hardship. See, Paul, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to make tents and minister the word at the same time. It wasn't easy to be, to do both, to be a full-time worker and a full-time pastor. And it's not. I can tell you that from the past six years of experience, almost seven years. If you've talked to me, you know that my heart's desire is to be here more, to minister to more, to you more, to do more things, have more Bible studies, to you know, just have one-on-ones with you. But I also have to be conscious of the fact that, you know, I do work full-time. And I, again, I wish I can do more here in ministry, but it's, it's difficult. It's challenging. I understand what Paul is saying here. Paul toiled because he loved the believers, and he wanted to help them as much as possible. He also told the Corinthians something similar. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, I am not seeking what is yours, 
but you. For children ought not to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So again, in verse 9, he points out his work. In verse 10, he points out his walk, implying that fathers must live so that they're good examples to their children. He could call the Thessalonian believers as witnesses that his life had been exemplary in every way. But, and also, there wouldn't be anyone there who could accuse Paul of being a poor example. Furthermore, God had witnessed Paul's life. And Paul wasn't afraid to call God as a witness that he lived a dedicated life while caring for the church family. His life was devout. In the Greek, this means to carefully fulfill the duties God gives to a person. Our word pious is close to it. If you think of piety at its best, and not as some fake kind of religion. His life was also righteous. This refers to integrity, uprightness of character, and behavior. This isn't the righteousness of the law, but the practical righteousness that God works in our lives as we yield to Him. Paul's life was also blameless. Literally, the word means not able to find fault in. His enemies might accuse him, but no one could level any charge against Paul and prove it. As a Christian, as believers, we're supposed to be blameless and harmless as we live in this world. Consider that. Think about that. Your enemies, those that don't that want to see your life ruined and want to see you go down in, in flames, could they accuse you and prove it? Can they accuse you of doing all kinds of wrong, immoral things and prove it? Or would it be a hard time trying to prove it? We must walk as Christians, especially among unbelievers, upright, blameless, righteous, and devoutly. And in verses 11 and 12, He points out his words, implying that a father mustn't only support the family by working and teach the family by being a good example, but he must also take time to speak to the family members. Paul knew the importance of teaching these new believers the truths that would help them grow in the Lord. Paul dealt with each of the believers personally. As busy as he was, Paul still had time for personal counseling with the members of his church, of that church. Let me bring up this side note too, in case you didn't know that if you ever wanted to have a sit down one on one with me, I don't mind. As busy as my schedule is, I can you know, make arrangements with you. Preferably, it would be right after I get out of work, we could meet here or at a a restaurant, a Denny's or whatever at, you know, eight in the morning, nine in the morning. But if that can't work for you or doesn't work for you, then I'm willing to make the sacrifice of sleep and rest and time with my family to, to meet with you and talk with you because I know 
I also know it's important that you hear my heart. I want to know your heart. I want to know what's going on. We can do that right now as, obviously, with the size of the church that we have. Later on, it's going to get harder and harder, especially see this church grow bigger and bigger. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of me, Isaac, meet up with us. We're not just available on Sundays, just like Paul. We had to deal with each believer personally. While it's good for church leaders to address the larger group, spending time with people on a one-to-one basis is also needed. Our Lord was never too busy to speak to individuals. Even though he preached to great multitudes, to be sure this difficult and demand to be sure this is a difficult and demanding work, but it's rewarding, but it's a rewarding work that ultimately glorifies God. Paul encouraged the new believers. This is what a father does with his children. Children are often or easily discouraged. New Christians need someone to encourage them in the Lord. The word exhorting in our authorized, in our, in our some of our version means to call to one side, to encourage. It doesn't mean that Paul scolded them. Rather, it means he encouraged them to go on, to continue on, to not give up with the Lord. Paul also comforted them. This word carries the same idea of encouragement with the emphasis on activity. And so Paul not only made them feel better, but he made them want to do better. A father doesn't pamper a child. He doesn't pamper a child. Rather, he must encourage the child to go right back and try over and over again. Leaders, those who want to Be leaders in this church or whether you're watching this and are a leader in, in your church. A child or when a new believer falls or, you know, you don't want to want to encourage them. You want to encourage them to get back up. Keep trying. Keep going. Keep walking. Do not give up. Christian encouragement Mustn't come, mustn't, Christian encouragement, encouragement mustn't become an anesthesia that puts us to sleep. It must be a stimulant that awakens us to do better. Let me repeat that again. Christian encouragement mustn't become an anesthesia that puts us to sleep. It must be a stimulant that, that awakens us to do better. Finally, Paul charged them. This word means that Paul testified to them out of his own experience with the Lord. It carries the idea of giving personal witness. Sometimes we go through difficulties so that we may share with new Christians what the Lord has done. God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, were, we ourselves have received from God. And that's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Those of us that have been parents, those of you who have been parents, know that our children, especially teenagers, have one myself. They don't like to hear us say, now, back when I was a teenager, back when I was a kid, 
They don't like to hear that. But here's the thing. It's important. That is an important part of training a family. It's a wonderful thing when a spiritual father can encourage and help his children out of his own experience with the Lord. You can tell, have those conversations with newer believers and say, hey, when I was young in the Lord, I made this mistake. I made the same mistake you're making. And it would led me down a wrong path. It's okay. You're helping them. You're encouraging them. You're ministering to them. Whether they want to take that advice, hey, you know, it's, it's on them. You're sharing it. You're giving it. You're passing on that wisdom. You're passing on what the Lord has taught you. So whatever you're going through, whether it's a physical illness, mental illness, and emotional, um, going through some emotional problems, you're going through some serious, um, some serious, some serious trials. First of all, reach out to those with others because you never know, they may have experienced something similar. But also, know that you will eventually, God is using you. God is using that experience, that thing you're going through. Do something great. Do something good. Don't give up. Don't think that it's, it's for nothing. So what's the purpose of, for this fatherly ministry to the believers? His aim, Paul's aim, as verse 12 says, was that his children might walk worthy of God. Just as a father wants to be proud of his children, so the Lord wants to get glory through the lives of his children. Paul ministered to them in such a personal way because he was teaching them how to walk. Every child must learn to walk, but in doing so, they must have good models to follow. And so here, Paul admonished them to walk worthy of the Lord. Church, as Christians, to walk worthy of the calling, as as Christians, we have to walk worthy of the calling we have in Christ Jesus. God has called you. You are saved by grace. Your, we as a church are part of His kingdom and glory. One day, we shall enter the king, the eternal kingdom and share in His glory. This assurance ought to govern our lives and make us want to please the Lord. The verb in verse 12 is in the present tense. In other words, who is constantly or continually, continually calling you. See, God called us to salvation, and He's constantly calling us to a life of holiness and obedience. And here's what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 says. But as he, and now it's from uh, one of the other versions, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, behavior, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. In a sense, you know, one of these things, although again, the, the topic here is character, theme here is is character and we're looking at this as uh, character traits of of a Christian this passage here this passage we just read read, in a sense this gives us a beautiful example of New Testament follow up New Testament follow up 
See, Paul has shown us how to raise the babies. We must be faithful stewards, loving mothers, and concerned fathers. If we're not faithful to God, we may find ourselves becoming doting mothers and pampering fathers. Children need discipline as well as love. In fact, discipline is one evidence of love. It's no wonder the church at Thessalonica prospered in spite of persecution and shared the gospel with others for miles around. They had been born right and nurtured right. This, my friends, is a good example to follow. To sum up our passage here, the main point of these 12 verses is that Paul's witness among the Thessalonians was effective because it was based on his bold proclamation of the truth of the gospel. The two motives undergirding and inspiring this testimony were that Paul wanted to please God and wanted others to please God in order to glorify him. The first motive is stated before the second is significant. The first motive is stated before the second is significant. One must want to please God before he can truly desire others to want to please God. The kind of attitudes and lifestyles that Paul depicts in these verses were pleasing to God and resulted in influencing others for the gospel because the life he lived was inexplic inexplic in inextricably linked to the truth he preached. When we don't live a life in a manner that demonstrates the truth of the good news, when we don't live our lives, character traits of a Christian, we don't please God and don't have a godly, and don't have godly boldness. Rather, what we say about the gospel with our lips may have no lasting persuasion. Me, excuse me, I almost started choking there. Rather, um, what we say about the gospel with our lips may have no lasting persuasion and effectiveness for the lives of the hearers with the result that they will not please God and inherit his glorious kingdom. We want to please God and we want others to please God. We have to look at our character. Character is important. Character matters. As a believer, as a Christian, how you live your life when no one is looking, when no one is around, having that integrity, having that honesty, being bold, being, knowing who you truly are, it's going to be an effective instrument in sharing the gospel. So does your character matter? Yes. Ask yourself what kind of person you are when no one is around, when no one's looking. God knows. He sees. He examines the heart. If you desire that, you've never had that. And you want this life, this born-again life, this life that Paul is speaking of here. You want these characteristics. You want to have, be a person of character. You must be born again. So many, you have so many brothers and, you, you know, there's, there's, there's Christians where it's a church, we're a family. We want to welcome you in. It's not 
uh, private club. It's only available to some. It's available to everyone who wants it. Friends, those watching and listening, I'll tell you something about the Christian faith. It's not what the world makes it out to seem. It's not what these movies and TV show makes it out to be. God loves you, He cares for you, he desires for you to have life and to live it in its fullest. He sent His Son to forgive you of your sins and to free you from the bondage of sin and death. If you want to be freed from that, if you want to be delivered from that, I want to invite you to the cross and offer your, and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. And I'm not selling you anything. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not saying that you need to come here to the church in order to, to be a Christian. No. All you've got to do is sincerely ask the Lord to come into your life to forgive you of your sins and to be born again. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to Ask Jesus to come into your life. And I want, I want you to pray this. Wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, all, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely prayed that, I want to welcome you to the family of God. And I want you to reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps of your Christian, new Christian walk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for clicking on this video. Hope you have a great week. Be a blessing to others. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.